Hi, Vita. How are you? Hi, Lampo. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Am I clear? Yes, you're very clear. Your reception is a bit better now. Okay, we're on. Hello, everyone. Namaste. Nice to be with you again. Uh, just get my... There, okay. <clears throat> Everyone okay out there? Lenny, how are you? You're good. Nice. Very well, okay. thank you very much. Nice to see you. Yes, nice to see you too. How, how is Sien doing? Um, Sien is good. Everyone in the family is good. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. Give him my best wishes. I will. I will. Thank you. Okay. So, Peter, what should we do? Meditate or? Oh, we do ETP so, correct? Yes, please, Long Paul. We'll do ETP so first and then uh, we'll go into meditation. Sounds like a plan. Okay. Um, so, please join uh, anyone who wants to to chant ETP so. We'll chant three times. I have some accompanying voices. So um, we'll start with our reflections on the Triple Gem. Eti piso wa raham samha samputo vicha charana sampano sugato loka vidu anuttaro purisadhamma sarati sata deva manusanam puto bhagavati savata Bhagavata Dhammo Sante Tiko Akaliko Enipasiko Opanaiko Pachatam Vedita Vinyu Hiti Supati Pano Bhagavato Savaka Sanko Chupati Pano Bhagavato Vatua Savaka Sanko Nyaya Patipano Bhagavatua Savaka Sanko Yadi Niti Patipano Bhagavatua Savaka Sanko Yadi Danchatari Purisa Yuka Niyata Purisa Bhukala he sabagavatu savaka sanko ahuneyo pahuneyo dakineyo anjali karaniyo anuttaram Punya ketam loka sadhiti piso magawa Araham sampasam purdo vicha charana sampano Sugato loka vidu anuttaro purisadhamma sarati sata Deva Manusana Bhutto Bhagavati Savakato Bhagavata Dhammo Sande Deko Akalito Hei Pasiko Ovanaiko Pachatam Vedita Po Vinyu Patipano Bhagavato Savaka Sangoa Ujubati Pano Bhagavato 
30 minutes, okay. No, okay. I can do that. My clock can do that. Look at that. 30 minutes later, it's cooking away. All right, I'll give a bit of instruction and then we can sit quietly. So, let go of the past and forget about the future. <laughs> Not so easy. But awaken to the present moment. So let go of the past. Let go of the future. And just how does it feel to be here right now? Feel the temperature of your body in the room. Uh, listen to the sounds that are in the space that you are meditating in. Let the sounds come to you. Feel your posture. Feel your lower back. 
Move up the spine, feeling each vertebra. Physical sensations up your spine. To the back of your neck. Imagine that the back of the neck is like a drawer in a cupboard, in a chest of drawers. And open the drawer so your neck goes slightly back and your chin tucks in. Feel your shoulders, let your shoulders drop and feel your spine rise. Let your shoulders drop to the ground and feel your spine. Bring attention to your mouth. Feel the physical sensations in the mouth. Let them become conscious. Feel the lips. The gums and teeth. The left wall inside the mouth the right wall inside the mouth. Let it be feeling, let it be sensation. Feel the tongue, feel the root of the tongue. Feel the whole mouth now as sensation, as vibration, as radiation. So no concept here, this isn't thought. I'll let that be what it is. From the inside of the mouth, move to the ear canals. Feel inside the ear canals, whatever sensation is there. Feel the outer architectures of the ears. Let it be sensation in awareness. Allowing these things just to come into consciousness as sensation. Feel your nose. Bridge of the nose. Nostrils. Now don't squeeze your eyes trying to look at the nose. The eyes are in awareness. So just let the sensation be what it is, radiation. Feel the eyes, the orbits, and the eyes themselves. And let the eyes just kind of drop out of the head. Feel the muscles around in the temples, move back to feel the brain. Feel the right side of the brain as sensation. Feel the left side. If you feel something, fine. If you feel nothing, fine as well. You're not looking for something, but observing what is. Feel the top of the head, scalp. Feel the back of the head. Now feel the whole head as a mass of sensations, not as a concept, just as energy vibrating, radiating. Let it be conscious. In awareness. Feel the neck, back of the neck, the throat, 
left side and right side. The whole neck, that whole area inside the throat. Let it manifest as energy sensation. Feel the connection left side of the neck to the shoulder. Feel the whole shoulder as sensation. Left upper arm, outside armpit, the warmth there. Left elbow, forearm, left wrist, left thumb, forefinger, middle finger, ring finger, and small finger. Feel the palm of the left hand. Feel the whole left arm from hand to shoulder as sensation. Right side of the neck to the right shoulder. Upper arm, arm outside, inside warmth. Right elbow. And forearm, right thumb, forefinger, middle finger, ring finger, and small finger, palm of the right hand, the whole right hand as sensation in awareness, right hand to right shoulder. Both hands to both shoulders, right and left. Feel the neck and feel the whole head. As sensation in awareness. Feel the chest area. The outer structures of the chest and the upper back. Inside the chest, walls, the lungs, the diaphragm, the heart, whatever manifests there. You don't have to find anything special. Let it be energy. Abdominal area. Feel the whole outer part, lower spine, skin, the belly. And then any, any intestines and kidneys, liver, the stomach, all that inside the abdominal area. Feel the pelvic area, pelvic bones, and the organs in the pelvic area. The hips, both hips, take the left hip. Feel the left hip and left thigh as sensation. Nothing to become, nothing to get, just knowing the way things are. Feel the left knee, the lower leg, ankle, and foot. From the left foot to the left hip, feel that whole area as one mass of sensations radiating, vibrating. Feel the right hip and the right thigh, the right knee, lower leg, right ankle and the right foot from the foot to the hip 
right side, you know, that whole area as a mass of sensations, not a concept. So both legs, the torso, both arms, shoulders, neck and head. So step back, whole body awareness as sensation, as feeling. So awareness of body as sensation, energy, vibration, feeling, whatever you want to define that as. And the body is object in awareness. Listen to sound. Notice that sound is an object in awareness changing. Feel the body. Notice that the body is an object in awareness changing. No, notice that awareness doesn't change, it just knows. So be that knowing. So once you've established awareness like this, then you can use the breath. You just met the bhavana, whatever you like, but first and foremost, establish right awareness, right knowing. Okay, I'll, I'll leave that and then we'll just sit quietly for the rest.
Good evening, Long Pong. Good evening. We're now we'll request Lama Tong. Brahma Jaloka Dipati Sahapati Katanjali Divarangaya Jada Santi Dasata Paraja Kajatika Dese to Dama Anukam Pimam Paja Namo Tassa Pakawato Arahato Sama Santasa Namo Tassa Pakawato Arahato Sama Santasa Namo Tassa Pakawato Arahato Sama Santasa Putan Damang Sankang Namasa Oh Here we are again enjoying each other's company, I hope. Uh, here, in, here in the monastery, the days are getting, the daylight is getting shorter and shorter. Darkness is longer. Um, it was, I think, what's the temperature this morning? Five degrees this morning, cold. And, uh, but it's still very beautiful. There's still a lot of, gold in the maple trees but soon all the leaves will be gone and what else oh i, I almost ran into a porcupine a couple of hours ago I was out at the back nirasa's kuti and i was walking and i didn't see the fellow i almost walk you don't want to walk into a porcupine it's not a good idea you know pork <laughs> porcupines here we go we do a porcupine lesson <laughs> Porcupines have quills, right? They don't have fur. When you look at them at a distance, you'd think it's almost fur. So when an animal comes near it, then the quills go up and the quills are very, very strong and they have a barbed end, right? Like a, like a little fishing hook. So if a dog isn't really wise and runs after the porcupine, and he sticks his nose into the porcupine's back, then the quills will lodge in the poor fellow's nose. Very painful. And then the dog owner has to take the poor thing to the veterinarian. And uh, in Ontario, it costs, I'm told, $5 a quill. I don't know what it costs in Singapore. Bita, you have to tell me. <laughs> Maybe there's a better rate, <laughs> but uh, pearl you see sometimes. And I, we had a we had a raccoon here who was a bit kind of malnourished or not not fully developed. So he hung around our 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 our, uh, our compost bin. We get a lot of animals coming to the compost pile: deer and raccoons and so on. And this fellow had three quills in his nose and we couldn't really catch the fellow. So it was oh, quite painful. Eventually the quills fell out. So there you go, your porcupine lesson. Um, they're very slow. And also, oh yes, another thing. Um, porcupines are always looking for salt, it seems to me. So at Wapapong, we had a, we had a very, very tame porcupine. Unfortunately, it liked the salt, which was on the monk's flip-flops. Mm -hmm. So it would eat the flip-flops. So you, you had to put your flip-flops inside your kuti or you wouldn't have, or you'd have chewed flip-flops. And also I'm told, it never happened to me that this little fellow was so tame that he would lick the monk's toes to have some salt. Amazing, huh? And then here, when 
Ajahn Kusala built the first kutis. He used a, a kind of normal plywood for the cladding outside. And we found out that porcupines, because they're always looking for salt, they chew into the plywood because the glues have salts in them. So then some of our kutis all along the bottom edges, there's all these chew marks. And of course, the, the, the monk that was living there, maybe two in the morning, the porcupine would come and chew, chew, chew. And first, you know, first night, you're kind of very gentle with it, go away, go away. By the fourth night, you're throwing large logs at it to get out of there. So, I don't know, a little bit of dosa there, I think. Um, but now we've, we've renovated the kutis so they don't eat our kutis. So that's the porcupine life. So well, now I, I need to say something about Buddhism. Um, <laughs> so let's say what? Let's say, let's say you, you wake up in the morning and you have a toothache. Okay? I don't wish it upon you, but this does happen. And you, you think, oh, it's nothing. Be all right. And the toothache persists. So then you think, oh, I better... And, and it persists, so you take some aspirin, you think, I better go see the dentist. So you phone the dentist, and you get an appointment, the dentist sees there's some infection, fixes the infection, and you don't, you don't have any toothache. So that's the end of suffering, but that's not the Four Noble Truths. That's not what we mean by suffering in the Four Noble Truths. That's what we mean by dentistry. <laughs> but the Buddha wasn't a dentist but he would have recommended going to the dentist. So we call that worldly dharmas. And uh, they're important. It's important to go to the dentist and floss, I'm told. <laughs> These are important things. But the Four Noble Truths is, is a bit different, isn't it? And, and so in terms of having pain, say the toothache, you look at it two ways. One way is you look at it as a conventional problem, which you have to deal with, and you do that. And that's where we talk about the sense of self. I have a toothache. I need to phone the dentist. I have a dentist. Uh, I have an appointment. I better make sure I'm on time for the appointment. So the sense of I as a, as a story in the world of things. Then the other way of looking at the toothache is to say that um, toothache is a, is a phenomena in nature or in awareness. So the phenomena of pain is something in awareness. And both are true, both are true. Uh, the one involves a sense of I, but the other involves a teaching around what we call the five khandhas or phenomena. So that's the phenomena of pain feels this way. Now, in terms of the Four Noble Truths, why that's important is because that reflection that uh, say, pain feels like this, is the opening to the Four Noble Truths. There is suffering. So, so when you think about the First Noble Truth, that doesn't sound like much, that statement, there is suffering, but actually it's the opening to the Dharma because um, it's the switch from I am in pain to there is pain. And that's the letting go of what we call Sakaya Ditti or personality view. Personality is still important. You still need to go to the dentist and need to take care of the body. So we're not dismissing that and saying that actually this experience doesn't exist or that, it, you know, in some kind of silly, silly way. The experience does exist. It does hurt. And we need to do something about it. But when we say there is suffering, you know, that is the awakening to the phenomena of suffering. And if you don't understand that, that basic difference, then you don't really get the Four Noble Truths. There is suffering. I mean, that's, yeah, I know that. That's not a philosophical thing, that there is suffering. That's not it. Or a kind of statement about life in general. It's, 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 no, it's, the, it's the way the Buddha, I think, the Buddha awakens us, uh, asks us to awaken to this as a phenomenon in nature. If you don't do that, then, and we don't do that sometimes. So um, say you get, uh, you know, you have a, you have a difficult 
person in your family or at work and the person is really not nice, not a nice person at all, everyone agrees. And, and, and you feel quite irritated by them or, or intimidated by them or angry at them or frightened of them. You can very much just think about me and that person and never really notice that there is suffering. You know there's suffering. I mean, you know, you know you're afraid or you know you're angry, but you never really make the statement sometimes that there, that, that there is suffering. This is suffering. Suffering feels like this. That's the, first, that's the entry to the first noble truth. Now, with the body, it's a bit easier to do. With emotions, it's very difficult to do. But so what we do is we train in this, this sense of awakening to like just sense experience. So uh, in, in, in listening, we just say sound is like this. There is sound. Or in this meditation that we did, there is bodily feeling. And you could say, sure, it's my bodily feeling, but we're trying to let go of that my, me and my, that that self-perception and just see it as a phenomenon in nature. And then we do that with the other senses, smell. So let's say you, you, you have, you open the fridge door and there's a rotten smell and oh gosh, something's gone off. I better check the fridge. I better clean out some of that food that's there. Sure, you do that. But, uh, and that's the sense of self, just like the pain. But also you can just allow uh, smell to be what it is. Smell is like this without any addition. And, and, and that, that establishes an attitude of receptivity or awareness or knowing with the different sense experiences. Sight, sight is more difficult. Sight's very attractive or so you, you can play around. Let's just let the visual images just be what they are. And you can notice how one image maybe attracts you or a one image repels you or something like that. And, and, and you, you're just always practicing the same thing of awakening to the sense experience, sight or sound or taste or bodily feeling. Now with emotions, it's, it's much, much more difficult because emotions are very wrapped up with self-identity. And again, that's not wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong, but it won't lead you to the, to the Four Noble Truths if you're only in self-identity. And, and so I'm angry at the person at work who is, everyone agrees, is very, very nasty. And I keep thinking about them and, and gossiping about them and thinking, what am I going to, how am I going to sort them out? That is probably necessary. But if I never say that uh, aversion feels this way or resentment feels this way towards this person, then I never awaken to the Four Noble Truths. And if I don't awaken to suffering as it's existing, then I can never move onwards to the other noble truths. So that is like, it's so important. This is so important. And then Lompar Samedo, he says, well, the way the text outlines it is there, there is suffering. Suffering has to be understood. Suffering has been understood. That's the way it's described in the, in the Dhamma Chakra Sutta. So, uh, that that willingness to to awaken and know dukkha is, I think, a big thing in humanity because it's much easier to blame or distract, even to blame yourself or distract and get away from it. Now we're we're we're, we're facing it full on. Um, we're not judging it. We're not saying it's wrong to suffer, but we're getting out of the self narrative without dismissing the self narrative. Right? I'm not saying that. You don't go to the dentist, no. So it's a kind of, there's always two ways in Buddhism that we operate. We operate in the conventional realm of morality and right living and going to the dentist. And then we operate in this other realm of phenomenology where we see the phenomena of experience as objects in awareness. And that's what this meditation is meant to do. And as you train in this uh, way of, of knowing phenomena arising and ceasing in awareness, arising and ceasing in awareness, then at, when, a, uh, when a phenomena hurts in some way, when, a, you know, when you, you feel off or when you've lost something or uh, you've been insulted or, or you have a medical diagnosis, which is difficult, or uh, you lose your job or, or, or you get demoted or whatever it might be, um, then you're, because you've been practicing awakening to the way things are, you feel the discontent now as an object. 
rather than just being the subject. If you've never trained, you usually just become the subject of the discontent and you run for it and then it changes eventually or not. Um, so having done that, having un awake, awoken to that, then you can understand it. And what do we mean by understanding? Well, it, it, it feels like this. Feeling betrayed feels like this or, 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 or losing, losing my job feels like this. You still do everything you can to get your job or to you know, call the person that betrayed you, but that's not liberating. It's important, but it's not liberating because life comes up in ways which we can't really control. So living the life the best you can, you, you start to awaken to these very real um, modes of, of, of discontent and discomfort that we have naturally as human beings. It's just a, a part of being human. And now we, we begin to say, well, what's the real problem with the memory of having been spoken to unkindly at work? What, what is the suffering? And, and if you observe, you understand it, it feels this way, you see that, well, I didn't want that to happen to me. I don't want this feeling now. And that's a noble truth, isn't it? That they're not wanting. I don't want this. I don't want this discontent. I don't want this feeling of being insecure. I don't want the diagnosis or whatever. And once you see that the real problem is not the emotional tone, because emotional, the, the affect of emotions or the tone of emotions is negative and positive. It's just a given, isn't it? You have, you, there's no way you can get out of that. You have these, this range of emotions from being, you know, frightened by a porcupine. <laughs> I wasn't really frightened or a bear or, 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 or uh, being disappointed by, uh, you know, your child's, rude words to you or, or, or be annoyed at your own self for, for not doing something or being excited and being in love. So human emotion is huge. It's this whole, whole, whole huge range. And we are cultivating wholesome emotions. We are trying to cultivate compassion and kindness and forgiveness as, as just a way of living our life decently. But you can't always, you can't always feel compassionate or forgiving, you quite often don't feel compassionate. You just feel bloody minded or, or you really don't want to forgive or because you've really been hurt and, and fair enough. So if you, if you just take the, the kind of developing the wholesome states of mind as, a, as the only part of the practice and, and you can't do it, like someone is, is, you know, cheats you at work and says that, something that, that makes you look bad and they're lying and manipulating something really horrible. And then you go home and you feel horrible from that. And then you think you have to do metta bhavana. You can't do that. Who can do that? Because you don't feel metta bhavana, you feel murder or you feel homicidal or something like that. You, know, you don't feel good. So, so if, you, if you take the Four Noble Truths, then you're very on, you know, it's, it takes a lot of honesty, doesn't it, this path? It's the honesty of saying, yeah, I'm really, I really want to hurt this person because they hurt me, right? And so you're waking up to that. This is a feeling of wanting to hurt someone rather than thinking a good Buddhist never wants to hurt anyone anytime. Please go ahead and cheat on me. <laughs> but, you, you know, because you're human, you feel these things. So, so this is the feeling of revenge. Revenge feels this way. You'll only get to, I think, to forgiveness when you can know the feeling of revenge. Because if you try to suppress the feeling of revenge, you, it's not going to work. You, you might overlay it with some very nice words of forgiveness, but deep down inside, maybe you haven't really allowed that to be conscious. So when we say understand suffering and also let, let suffering be conscious, it can't hurt you. It's not your enemy. It's a phenomenon. Don't be afraid of fear can't hurt you. Fear can't hurt awareness, right? Awareness just knows fear. Jealousy can't hurt awareness. Awareness knows jealousy. Right? So, so there's, 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 it's okay. It's okay to feel all kinds of negative things because that's not who you really are. You don't, you know, you don't intentionally feel jealousy. You just feel it. You don't intentionally want to murder your, <laughs> your, 
the boss and the boss just kind of did it to you. So, so, so the sense of allowing things to become conscious is, is, it's one of the first lessons I really took from Lompo Sameda way, way back. He said, let it become conscious. Let the fear become conscious. What do you mean? Well, don't be afraid of it. Just let it be there. What's it really like? What's it feel like in your in your body, in your guts? What kind of thoughts come up? Think the thoughts deliberately. Think terrifying thoughts. Not too long. <laughs> Not all day. But just let it become conscious. And this is part of the first noble truth. There is suffering. Suffering has to be understood. Not, not in a kind of psychoanalytical way. That's, that's not what we're talking about. That, ha that has its place, you know, in, in, in the community of psychoanalysis where those things might be helpful. But here we're just seeing it as a phenomenon, as a kanda, as a sankara. It, you know, it feels like that. So, so we'll let it become conscious. And then you'll see that the desire to get rid of it is the problem. Right? Or the desire then to, to follow it is the problem. And the desire to follow it is actually the desire to get rid of it. Like when I, when you, if you feel angry at someone and you think about, you know, you know how you're going to get them next time you see them say something really nasty to them in front of the whole community. So they really heard that blah, 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 right? You're getting away from your own anger by hurting someone else mentally. But you don't get away with it because it just keeps going, doesn't it? So making something conscious is, is actually uh, uncomfortable, to say the least. And that's why distraction is a much more you know, pleasant thing. You do something pleasant, something unpleasant. So making conscious the feelings of discontent or loneliness or loss or boredom, all these different ways that we, we, we face experience, it's actually a difficult thing to do now because of the the, the um, sophistication of distractions we have now. Really, I mean, how, who feels boredom anymore, right? It seems like you just look at something to feel excited, but that doesn't work because the mind is very, very restless. So now we're trying to discover the peace of the mind and the entry point is quite often through dukkha. It's not the only way through dukkha and by be, by becoming conscious or letting letting dukkha become conscious in whatever minor or ma major way it is, what you establish is, is, as I was saying last night, I think what you're doing is actually metta bhavana. Because metta bhavana is the acceptance of all things. Now, accepting jealousy into consciousness may not feel like metta bhavana. But metta maybe isn't just a feeling. We, we quite often define metta bhavana as this loving feeling to other beings. Yeah, sure, that's nice. It happens, develop it if you can. But maybe it's more than that. You know, maybe it's something bigger than that. And I would say it is because the, the acceptance into consciousness of, of the kind of shadow side of your life or the negative side of your life or the 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 you know, childhood experiences, you know, all these different things we have, when you let them into consciousness, is that not kindness? Isn't that like the kind thing to do to this? If you see it as yourself, I'm a terrible person, and you get caught in that kind of dualistic definition that I shouldn't feel jealous, and I should love everyone, then that's attavada, that's sakaiditi, that's personality view. That's not the first noble truth. There is jealousy, jealousies like this. So as you, as you do that, then you become more, I think what happens is a kind of intuitive courage begins to be more prevalent around the negativity that we experience as human beings. A kind of intuitive courage, I'd say. That, yeah, I think, yeah. Or confidence, maybe. Let's say confidence. And intuitive confidence that it's, that it's okay. It's okay to feel fear. It's okay to feel jealousy. It's not, not who I am. It will change whatever language you like. And as you do that, you see that the problem with jealousy maybe, or the problem with uh, loneliness is not wanting it, the vibhavatana. That's why last year I, I suggested the homework. Uh, look at resistance. Look at resistance for one year. And this is where you get resistance. Vibhavatana, I don't want this. Naturally enough, who wants it? But then by, by not buying into this resistance to the way things are, you then establish your, 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 your real home is awareness and full acceptance of the way things are. And that is the road to transcendence because it's no longer just a 
a, a delightful experience of love, it's the openness to all experience, love and hate, good, bad, indifferent, right? And you can see how that, to me, that would be the only avenue of transcendence, the only avenue of, 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 of a profound peace, which is not dependent on costs and conditions, which isn't contingent on situations that come and go. How else could it work? Like, could it possibly work if I dismiss one part of my emotional life and then simply hope that the other, the positive part will manifest? I don't think that could work. Having said that, that I mean, there is a place for encouraging uh, compassion, yeah. It's very important, as much as I can. Encouraging generosity, uh, encouraging forgiveness, this is fine, but not at the cost of repression and annihilation and trying to get rid of something because that won't really liberate you. And then I, I think from that intuitive confidence, you you begin to, to like liberate uh, greed, hatred, and delusion as phenomena that dominate consciousness. They're liberated in the sense that they come into consciousness. They are an each You know, they're not really who you are. They're conditioned phenomena from previous whatevers. And, 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 and they're not worthy of making a problem on them. So the, the, the kind of confidence then is that it's okay to feel this negativity. As you feel that, then you begin to see it's, it's, it's power to delude you begin, is less. Power to delude you is much less when you, when you say it's okay to feel jealousy. Where's the delusion? Right? I, I, and jealousy is like this. Toothache is like this. It's the same kind of practice. And then the, because the power of jealousy, in this case, whatever you want, no longer is deluding you into attachment and self-view, then its power... To, to manifest begins to fall away too, because it's no longer energized. You're no longer energizing the self-view with the whole language, oh, I shouldn't be this way, I shouldn't be this way, and so on. It's just a phenomenon. It comes and goes, it comes and goes, and comes and goes. And, that, and, and it's interesting, the phenomena of negativity, greed, hatred, and delusion, are always fed by ego thoughts, self-thoughts. And when, they, when those self-thoughts are no longer fueling those phenomena, those habits, uh, then the sense of self falls away. There is still individuality. You still have to go to the dentist, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the whole sense that I am, I am simply a kind of incarnate body and, and these are my emotions, that begins to fall away. And this is where the Brahma Viharas manifest very naturally because that's all that's left really. Because there's no, no more kind of ego stuff um, covering over the, the, the innate purity of the heart. Because when, when the heart is not distracted and, 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 and taken up with these ego uh, self scenarios and narratives, and you have the patience to witness it, witnessing uh, awareness, openness begins to be the, the, your real home. And then you see actually that real home is also the Brahma Viharas. This is really wonderful. Not because you're manipulating it to be that, because that's the that's just the, the natural result. And then the Brahma Viharas have a chance to manifest according to causes and conditions. When compassion is necessary, compassion arises. When there's nothing happening, then peace is there. So so that's that's the aspect of the third noble truth, the, the ending of things. So how do things end? Well, you can look at it two ways. Cessation can be. Eroda is the word we use. Um, it can be just the, the, the ending of the, the self-attachment. Like if, if we use the same example of jealousy, maybe jealousy comes up, someone is more successful than you or their, their kids are more successful than yours or something silly like that, and, but it's serious for you and you feel jealous, then a cessation there can be just the cessation of the sense of self around the jealousy. Jealousy feels like this. In the same way that it can be around the body, you can have the toothache. Toothache comes, oh, God, there's a toothache. What am I going to do? Oh, gosh, I have to go to the dentist. True. And then you can say toothache feels like this. That's a cessation of self. Self-view. Uh, Sakayaditi. And, and, and then from that, you get the larger cessation of these habits running 
uh, running their course. So in the in the description in the fetters, uh, in in the kind of once returner and non return if you look at that, what it says, it says that greed and anger begin to lessen. That's all, no big deal. And and notice that in your own life, when you're not, when you see these phenomena as sankara, not really you, they begin to lessen, don't they? You feel less angry, and 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 you and you and you're not threatened by these things. Say like for myself, the kind of fears I felt. Um, if fear comes up, I'm not threatened by it anymore. I say, oh, I haven't seen you for a long time. Uh, surprise. But it's not a threat because it's not me. I know it's not me. It's just karma, karma of some, some, some sort. And so the, the heart is kind of liberated. And, 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 and then I think what awareness is, the profundity of what awareness is or knowing or presence becomes more and more apparent. In the beginning, awareness just seems like, yeah, I can, I kind of know what's going on, and I didn't trip on the, on the, on the ice, and, and you know, it's just functional. And then you see it's a powerful tool, and then you see it's a powerful refuge. It's your real home. It's the awakening, and that that those kind of insights of confidence, the confident insights, whatever you call it, uh, are gradual for most people. Some you read are like really precocious, so you read about great saints who somehow have all the barmi together and their experience of enlightenment is maybe very, very uh, quick and, and wonderful and lasts a long time. But for most of us, it's, it's like a beach going slowly into the ocean. But it's not something you attain. I think it's something you constantly realize and the rest takes care of itself. So you're never, you're never practicing for the future. Future takes care of itself. You're practicing in the present moment, let it go, non-attachment, and then these results come by themselves. So it's a very, it's also interesting teaching because it, by beginning with this human predicament, it gives you a very optimistic possibility. It's a very optimistic religion. This is the curious part of Buddhism. When, when people don't understand anything, Oh, they're always talking about suffering. Those Buddhists, they're really boring. I want love and, and unity with all beings and radiance. Yeah, okay, go for it. And, and yet, and yet, the Buddha's enlightenment is the most optimistic possibility of human consciousness, isn't it? Why? Because I think he saw, he saw the problem. It's just a misidentification with dukkha. That's all. That's all. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. Um, so, so trusting in that, tr like Lopo Samir is constantly encouraging us to trust in awareness and apply that trust to the Four Noble Truths, then you have a path. And, and when you have a path, then, then no matter what the, the, the trivial nature of dukkha is or the profound nature of dukkha is, you always have a way of approaching it. And that is a relief, isn't it? I mean, when I, when I found that I have a way of working with my fears. They're not just a bad joke that I have to somehow endure this lifetime. I have a way of working with anger. I always, I, I found that so encouraging and, and uh, inspiring. And, and then, of course, we have to take responsibility. If you have to do the work, but it's work which is, it's very noble, isn't it? It's very noble to take responsibility for your own heart, and and then share that, share that nobility with others. You know, it's a very, very very, very lovely path that way. As I often say, Theravada Buddhism is very intellectual. You can get all kinds of analysis going on. You can think yourself um, crazy. <laughs> you just think and think and think and think. But that's not understanding suffering. Like feeling jealous isn't a thought. It's not jealous. You know, the, the, the statement, jealousy feels this way, is a statement to take you to silence. And then what's it really like? The silence. That's, that's, that's not thinking. So the thought takes you to the silent knowing. But always just being involved and trying to figure out Buddhism through thinking will take you to more doubt. You might, you know, you might fool some people <laughs> with your cleverness, but it'd just be, you'd just be... Questions, answers, questions, answers. So then how do you use uh, right thinking, samasankapa? You use it in this way, you direct your thoughts 
to the to the use the four noble truths as the as the gateway for right thinking as the as the um, um, method of right thinking, and then it's not just abstract thinking. He's thinking the way the Buddha asked us to think. So there you go, something to reflect on. Thank you so much, Long Paul. Okay, Let's so both so. say three sadhus together. Handamayam o vadagata sadhu karangadama se Any questions, Peter? Or what's the program? Well, uh, thank you so much, Long Paul Sadhu, to the very um, wise teachings uh, today. Whilst we wait for our friends here in the community to participate in the questions and answer, uh, I have a question, Long Paul. Um, when we are practicing the knowing, sometimes one would feel this whole sense of fearlessness because there is a clear awareness, but there is a sense of fearlessness. And this fearlessness appears to be unnatural because you know humans tend to just want to grab and one on one, but when you are in a clear awareness, there is a a freedom and that freedom comes from a sense of fearlessness yeah right so my question is um do we continue to also know the sense of fearlessness and then see where what it, where it takes us? right i think you know in, in in buddhism we we use a lot of the the, the negative ways of looking at things like non, non-fear, non-hatred, non-greed, to notice that the mind isn't always caught up with those things, that it has a lot of space. And, and then, but like you say, quite often the tendency towards, say, anxiety about the future, about my kids, about the family, about my work, about COVID and, and, and the planet melting and all humanity being destroy you know there's a there's a heck of a lot of anxiety so both as a habit human habit and then also as a cultural habit it's huge so so we are being bombarded by that we have family conditioning we have childhood conditioning so fear is a is a is a uh, i think a huge part of the work we need to do to understand so when there is fearlessness just recognize that oh yeah Fearlessness feels this way, so that when fear arises, you see it much more objectively. A lot of people are just so wrapped up in their anxieties that they have no space around the fear. They just think it's a reality. And their thinking mind creates the, the narratives of fear. And it's a fearful world. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. My kids, I don't know. And so that seems like a, a, a fixed reality. But it is driven by fear. So when you notice fearlessness, Notice also there's no sense of self or, or there, there isn't the language of I. You know, there isn't me planning the future in some kind of anxious way. There's silence, there's stillness and cultivate that, know that. Um, and then when, it, when, it's, when, when fear comes up, then, oh, fear is an object. So then you, you see it much more as an object then. If you've, it's, it's kind of like if you notice space, then you'll also notice the objects more clearly. If you're just absorbed into objects, you don't notice the space so much. The same with the kind of, or, or, or non-anger. Notice like non-anger feels this way. So that when anger arises, oh, it's an object or, or, or non-greed. So that the, the capacity for this knowing is, is enhanced so that when the sense of self arises, you see it more and more clearly. You have also Barami, you, 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 you do a lot of dana, you keep the precepts, you care for your family, you care for the sangha. So you've cultivated 
a, a tremendous amount of, 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 of things which are the basis of fearlessness. Um, like we, we have hunters here. The hunting season will start in a week or two. You know, it's, I don't have any hunters in this room, so no one seems to know. Um, but it, soon they'll be shooting the deer uh, in, in the neighboring properties. There's a lot of, this is a lot of hunting around here. And, you know, you, man, you imagine what if a human being is hunting another animal then and trying to kill it, what's going to be the condition of that? That the worldview of the person hunting is going to be that uh, I might be hunted too. The hunter, because you know, the, so you, you're conditioning uh, a certain amount of fear. If, 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 if I cheat on people and I try to rip them off in a, some kind of horrible uh, negative way, <laughs> You know, and, and, and then I will think I'm being cheated. So there's a certain amount of fear there. Uh, if I lie, I think other people are lying to me, right? So when, when people live uh, in ways which are, are, are sloppy or, or, or immoral or, or all of that, they create the conditions for more fear and distrust. Your life is impeccable. You, 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 you live a good life. And, and so the basis of your fearlessness is also your lifestyle. It's not just the knowing, right? It's, it is that. Uh, but the basis of your fearlessness is dana, sila, uh, you're responsible. Uh, you don't, you know, if you have negative things, you don't take them on as a reality. So, so the results of practice are the whole thing, the whole normal eightfold path. And the knowing is, 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 is facilitated by good living, right? If I, again, if I have, cheated on you know the neighbors or, or whatever then i'm always fearful that the neighbors are going to come and get me or something like shoot me or something that's an extreme um so so the knowing is very difficult because now i've created a sense of self which is really protected hard to know that not doing that then the knowing is facilitated and so transcendence uh realization of nibbana all these things are facilitated by worldly dharmas, right? Very mundane things, just being kind and generous and all that. What's that got to do with Nibbana? Well, everything, <laughs> everything. Because if you don't have that basis, then, then social life is confused or, 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 or compromised or whatever way. So it's, you know, the, the sense of um, fearlessness to experience as a part of your good come up, right? And, and then you can deepen, well, what is that knowing? You can, de you can deepen your, your meditation from that, that, that very, very good foundation. That makes sense? Yes, it, uh, it does. It gives me also a lot of courage to look at life in, in, in that, um, on that middle path. Um, um, and it solidifies, you know, uh, the practice so much. Uh, of course, it goes against uh, the worldly winds, uh, certainly in a lot of aspects. Uh, but there is a lot of peace in the heart. There is a lot of clarity and, like you said, space. Space from yeah. the head. But, you know, there is this deep, deep depth, which is difficult to explain. But it's a feeling that I feel that there's a reservoir that's, you know, growing in here. That's it. Sato. Nice to hear. <laughs> and it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not like a, it's not the same as an experience. It's not like eating ice cream or something. And it's not sensual in that sense. It's something deeper than sense experience, isn't it? Yeah. Something more profound. That's why we talk, we have language like transcendence or unconditioned. We have this difficult language around that. And, and you get an intuition of what we're talking about that. Thank you so much, Anna Modana, for all the uh, the, the guidance, uh, Lompo. We know that uh, this is the first weekend that we are spending with all the great Sangha and Tisarena for having finished another season of the Vasa. So with a lot of respect, gratitude, uh, and love for the practice that you led the way. So thank you so much, Lompo. Yeah, we had a lovely ceremony last night. We all... You know, we have the, the, the forgiveness ceremony 
And what we do is we invite the lay residents who are with us for the Vasa to join in that. And it was lovely, wasn't it? So sort of really, really, very warm and 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 it was it's a it's a it's a very ritualized ceremony, but there, there's times where ritual really works well. You just do this thing together, and and yeah, it's it's really that's that's why I'm so grateful to Asia for uh, giving me not just Buddhism but also the culture of Buddhism, Bocha and you know friends in Singapore and Malaysia and and, and Burma and Sri Lanka, India. They've kind of given me. Uh, <laughs> They've given me a, a cultural home, um, not just a teaching, a cultural home that is uh, um, such a gift. It's, a, it's just such a gift. I'm, I'm really, really, really lucky that way. And, and uh, then I can share that gift with the Westerners who haven't, who haven't approached Buddhism, haven't seen Buddhism that much from a cultural standpoint. They've seen it more from like... Um, through therapies or through psychology or through mindfulness trainings, which are very good. But then this whole cultural structure, which, uh, which I, you know, I've learned over the years, is, is gives it a dimension which is hard to explain, uh, but, but it, it, it's very significant. I, I saw Malika, you had your hand up. And then Becky after. Malika uh, first, okay? Okay, Malika. There you go. Hi, Malika. You're almost. Can you unmute? Where did you go? I lost you. Malika just got chewed up with it. There you go. Can you unmute, Malika? You have a button? Oh, almost. You had it. Do it again. Yes. Okay. There you go. Hello, Malika. How are Hi. you? Ajahn, uh, thank you for all your teaching. And we had a good uh, three months. Uh, I had I had done some um, like promises made to practice during these three months. So it was very successful. Great. And, uh, because I made a pledge and then I kept it. So, good for you. Um, yeah. My question is, Ajahn, you were mentioning uh, uh, duality, and uh, I have read in even Ajahn Sumedho's book that uh, uh, Buddha has advised us to practice non-duality. Could you just uh -huh. explain these two words, Ajahn, the example well, you, of something? If you take the example of the dentistry, yeah. so in that, the conventional realm is duality. So I am someone who has a toothache. Yeah. I was born 75, 74 years ago. Uh, I have old teeth. Um, they're kind of functioning. Uh, it hurts. I have a passport. I am Vera Dummo. That's duality. It's not, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But another way of looking at this whole identity of me being Vera Dummo is that uh, is through the five khandas and or through the phenomena of conscious experience. So not only when I look at I am Viradhamma, when I make that statement, I cannot find a fixed thing called Viradhamma. I can see a perception. I can see, I can notice bodily feelings, but I can't find any identity. I can't find a fixed person. If you look at Malika, if you sit and say, I am Malika, what you'll get is silence. You might get another thought. I am such an age. I live in Brisbane. My background is Sri Lankan. But that's all thought. So when you let go of thought and you just observe the way things are, you start to touch what I mean by non-duality, meaning the sense of a self and a sense of otherness uh, begins to be challenged because there is just this moment. It's like this. There's things arising and ceasing, arising and ceasing. So we need both. We need the definitions of duality to live in a conventional realm. It's no good me going to the airport and saying, I am nothing. I won't get on the plane, right? So I need to say I'm here, Dumb, and I need my vaccine certificate. 
But also, if that is the only identity I have, then I'm doomed. The body's going to fall apart, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the Buddha says there is a, there is a liberation from self-identity, and that's by knowing body is body, feeling is feeling, perception is perception, uh, thought is thought, sen sense, uh, sense consciousness is sense consciousness, arising and ceasing, arising and ceasing. Then there isn't the sense of me being the thinker or me having a body. There is a body. So the sense of self falls away. And that's one of the ways we look at non-duality. And then, then the realizations around non-duality then are, are, are become progressively deeper and the very sense of a doer. Like, like in meditation, first of all, you, you drop the I thought. Huh? You still have a sense of doing something, being a meditator. You, you, you get a feeling for the silence, but there's still a me doing this and doing this technique. That begins to be unnecessary. Just, you don't need to do that. And the very sense of the doer is known as an object. And, and that's what we call asmimana or the different ways, conceit, the conceit of self. That falls away. And then what we do becomes even more profound. So what an arahant experiences as non-duality is obviously very, very profound. If you read, if you read Lompa Liam's uh, No Worries, what I, I always recommend, his enlightenment piece, you see his sense of non-duality is very, very profound. You read that. So we enter into that understanding first and foremost through what we call Sakaya Ditti, personality view. We let go of that and we see body as body. So this meditation on bodily sensation and feeling is a way of, of beginning to comprehend what that teaching around non-duality is. You're beginning to see that. And so, so when you, if you do this body meditation, uh, and just be very silent and notice, is there a sense of an individual? Is awareness separate? This is the phrase I was using a few months ago. Is awareness separate from experience? And it's not a question you want to answer through thought, because thought is always separate. We raise the question, is awareness separate from sound? And you'll find that it'll just, there'll just be silence. And that takes you into, into the insights of non-duality. Does that help, Malika? Thank, thank yeah? you, Ajahn. Thank you. Experiment with that. Like, experiment with the, with the um, is, is, is sound, you know, like, establish awareness, first of all. And, and then and, and just listen. And then say to yourself, is sound separate? Is awareness separate from sound? Don't think about it. Just allow the, allow the question just to bring you to silence. And you'll see, well, you, you tell me, you can send me an email, <laughs> see what you find. <laughs> okay. So is it, is it possible to practice non-duality and duality, uh, the separation you were, in meditation? You, you were doing that in, in, the, in the body meditation. You're practicing non-duality because you're knowing it as khandas, as phenomena. So each time you let go of self-thinking, you enter into non-duality non practice. What it means becomes more profound as you inquire into it. But that's the entry point. Thank you. And, but you still have to go to the dentist. <laughs> or whatever, right? So it's not, it's not dismissing the one part. It actually, it just makes life a much more deep possibility. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any other? Are there any other questions? <laughs> no, no, uh, no more hands up. Okay. No more. Yes. So we should uh, perhaps, uh, um, you know, allow you to take some rest. Uh, long haul. You'll have a very long uh, weekend. I think there's going to be celebration this weekend. Yeah, we celebrate. Are we? <laughs> I don't know. They organize everything. I just sort of show up. Okay. Um, should we finish with something or chant or? Yes. Uh, should we chant the um, the the words on loving please? Yes. Let's do that. That's a good idea. Always good. <laughs> oh yeah. <clears throat> This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness. 
and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety. May all beings be at ease, whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will, <clears throat> whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views. The pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Okay. Namaste, everyone. Be well. Thank you, Long See you next time. Uh, let's all bow three times together. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. All right. Ciao. See you in two weeks, Lampa. Two weeks' time. Okay. Bye. See you.